Good morning, church family. Hi, everyone. From the Veal Siblings. A happy day, happy day, happy day, happy day, happy day, I love you, sir. We really miss you. We miss you guys. Hope to see you all soon. I can't wait to see y'all. See you pretty, pretty soon, I hope. God bless you and happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Feliz Sábado. Happy Sabbath, Hinsdale Philam. Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning, Hinsdale Church family. Happy Sabbath to you and your family, wherever you are today. We're so glad that you're joining us for worship. You know, even though we can't be together in person, we can still stay connected. So we want you to join us for Sabbath School every Sabbath morning from 10 a.m. to 10.45 a.m. We offer four adult classes and three youth classes, a middle school class, a high school class, and a young adult class. It's very easy to join. Simply go on our church website, click on the Sabbath School Live tab, and then scroll down to your class. You simply then have to click directly on the Zoom URL, and it will take you directly to the Sabbath School. We offer, also offer three opportunities during the week to get together as well. On Tuesdays, our men's ministry has a prayer group at 7 p.m., our midweek prayer group meets and is led by, by Pastor Glenn. And then on Thursdays, we have a Bible study led by Pastor Joel Guerra and Fred Goliath. And if you have a small group in church and you need a way to meet, we're going to invite you to use one of our church Zoom sites. We have unlimited usage for you, and it's free, so please just contact me, and I'm happy to help you get started. We also want you to remember to keep the church in your prayers, especially in your giving. Please stay faithful to God in your tithes and offering this morning. So happy Sabbath to you once again. We're so glad that you're joining us for worship. We pray a special blessing for you and your family today. May God bless us as we worship him together this morning. Good morning, happy Sabbath church. As we worship, let's remind ourselves of the blessed hope we have in Jesus. God sent his son. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. He Because he lives. Because he lives. I can face. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. No fear is Because I know.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. At this time, we invite all of you to join us in a word of prayer. If it is at all possible, let's all kneel together. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you to give you praises. We praise you for all of your glory. We praise you for all of your love. We praise you for everything that you've done for us. We are so thankful that you are watching us every day. During this most difficult time, we uh, lift up especially our healthcare workers who are at the front lines and risking their own lives to help heal others. Help everyone who has been healed recognize that these gifts of life and health are coming from you. This morning, we ask that all of the healthcare workers and their families be blessed and protected as we go through this most difficult period. Dear Heavenly Father, we would also like to pray for all the students right now who have had to adjust to e-learning and online classes. I would also like to pray for the parents who have taken on the enormous task of teaching their own children in their own home. Dear Lord, please comfort all the students uh, who may have experienced disappointment this year. Please comfort us and help everyone to understand that we are making a positive difference and we are contributing by staying home and staying healthy and staying safe. So again, we ask all this for you to comfort and continue to guide all the students. We would also like to lift up the elderly Lord. Please keep them safe, keep them healthy and be with them and help them to feel your presence in their life, Lord. We would also like to lift up those who have lost their jobs due to staying at home, who can't find work and who are struggling financially, Lord. Be with them and help them through this struggle. Help them to know that you are with them and that you will carry them through. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with everyone who's sick and has COVID-19 and any other illnesses and Please keep them safe and healthy and please um, protect them with your healing hand. And thank you so much for protecting us and our whole entire church family so far. And we love you, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you also to be with those who have lost a loved one um, to illness or to COVID-19. Um, we know that you are our creator and that you are the ultimate healer and that you are control, in control. So please help us to keep the faith. Um, and now I'd like to close with a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.
Happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome to our service here today. I want to uh, thank Neila and Julieta for singing as well. Wasn't that so beautiful and super cute? I want to thank them so much uh, for doing a song out of uh, the song that we're going to do. I want to actually uh, greet you today in a different way. I want to greet you in, a, in the Vietnamese way. <laughs> uh, recently I learned, and by the way, I love Vietnamese food. But re recently I learned something really beautiful about the Vietnamese culture. Vietnamese people don't ask, how are you today? Instead they asked, they ask, have you had rice today? I thought that was so cool. Uh, have you had rice today? Because it's not a good day unless you've had rice. Can I get a witness? And uh, so I don't want to greet you, how are you today? I'm going to use the Vietnamese way. Have you had rice today, church? Have you had rice today? I bet 80% of y'all have said yes to that question. <laughs> um, I also want to welcome the Naperville uh, Philan Church today. I'm so glad that you're joining us. I pray that you will receive a blessing from joining us. And I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know you guys uh, more. Last thing before we pray, I want you to turn to your neighbor today, and if they don't have a smile on their face, um, I want to make sure you give them one, and tell them, it's, it, uh, I want you to tell them something, it's not right to be uptight on the Lord's day. Go ahead, tell them that. It is not right to be uptight on the Lord's day. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, You've been so good to us that even despite us being away from each other, we can still worship together. And Lord, I just pray, as you've done so many times before, would you just bless this time. Lord, this is a special time as we share God's word together as a church and as a body of Christ. As believers, we just come together and ask for you to, to breathe on us through your word. Lord, may... It be about your word, not about anybody or anything else. So thank you, Lord, uh, for being with us. Uh, speak to all of us. Speak to our hearts and our minds today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, for those who haven't been with us uh, for the last few weeks, I uh, just want to catch you up. We've been praising our way through the book of Psalms. We've been crying out to God using the book of Psalms. Uh, this is our third week of crying out to, to God, and I, I hope that by now you've seen that Psalms is a very, very special book. It was the hymn book for the children of Israel. It's still used in this way today, even today. And it was their book of prayers, it was the, their book of praises. The last two weeks we've learned that, that Jesus even used these Psalms. That even when he was on the cross, he used the psalms. And even when he was on the boat facing the storm, he used these psalms. And so, once again, we're going to look at one of the psalms. And I'm going to invite you to turn to your Bibles to Psalms chapter 32. Psalms chapter 32. And while you're getting to Psalms 32, I just want to say a little bit about this, this psalm. Um, David wrote most of the psalms. Not all of the Psalms in the book of Psalms, but he wrote this Psalm. And this Psalm is very, very special because this is actually David's story. This is, this is a Psalm about his own experience. It makes me think of a country song, <laughs> actually. Uh, those of you who don't know, I went to a boarding school in Tennessee and I went to a university in Tennessee. And I have to admit, even though it's kind of scary to admit, I actually learned to like country music a little bit. And one thing I liked about country music is that country music, a lot of country songs are, are, are stories. They're basically stories. And so it makes me think of this song, Psalms 32. This is David's story. So we're going to read Psalms 32. Oh, that's a bad habit my wife asked me to remember not to do. <laughs> so Psalms 32. I'm trying to remember not to lick my fingers. Psalms 32. Verse... Uh, uh, one. We're going to start at verse 1 and we're going to go to verse 5, okay? Here's the word of God. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. 
When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We're going to stop right there. So from Psalms 32, 1 through 5, I'm going to ask this question. How do we receive joy? Psalms 32, 1 through 5 tells us. How do we receive joy? It's when our sins are forgiven. Now, I want you to see this. I think this is very clear here. This is specifically talking about transgressions. You know, the Bible in, in other places says transgressions and sins. So there's a distinction there. They're similar, but they're not the same. Transgressions and sins. And transgressions are specifically the sins that you knew were wrong, but you did them anyway. That's transgressions. You knew they were wrong, that you just kind of go right ahead and you did them anyway. And David, was, since this is his own story, we, knew that, we know that he's talking about his own transgressions. We're we know that he's talking about his affair with Bathsheba, his lying and his betrayal and ultimately the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. So we know that we're talk we're, he's talking about that. And uh, we know that he's talking about this because, you know, in that story, he's trying to cover up all those things. Those were transgressions. He knew it was wrong and he did them anyway. But now he's talking in Psalms 32 as someone who's past all those transgressions and he's realized that his transgressions have been forgiven. His debt has been paid, verse 1. And yet, yes, he still has to suffer the consequences of his sins because we have to suffer those consequences when we sin. But he knows that his sins has been forgiven. So David, in Psalms 32, everybody, he, David is writing as a new man. He's writing as one who's been forgiven. His guilt is gone, all that weight is, it is off. And so he's writing as a new man and he's telling his story that when his sins were inside, when his sins were not confessed, they were, they were literally eating him up. They were literally killing him. You can see that in verse four and verse five. I want you to see something here from Psalms 32. This is, this is something that's, that's, that's really, really interesting. Unconfessed sin affects you physically, not just spiritually. It doesn't just torment your mind. It torments your soul. It torments your whole body. Now, with that said, no wonder people in the Bible times, like, like Job's friends, um, thought that if you were physically sick, it's because you did something wrong. It's because you did some kind of sin. Um, it's this kind of idea here. Uh, and, but by the way, Jesus put all that kind of thinking um, to rest. He put all to rest in the New Testament. You remember, um, I'll, I'll refer to you, John chapter 9. There's a story of a young man who was blind. If you remember this story in John chapter 9, you can, you can, you can write that reference and then look it up later. Um, in John chapter 9, people come to Jesus and, they're, and they're, they're basically referring to this young man who was blind and they say, Rabbi, Rabbi, um, who sinned, this man or this man's parents that he was born blind? I, I don't know if you guys remember that, but, but after that, Jesus put away that kind of thinking. He said, no, none of them did. It's not his fault. So church family, I just want to give you a warning here to go back to Psalms 32. It's not a up to us to judge why people are sick, why people are physically sick. Let's be careful of being the judge, amen. What David is saying in Psalms 32 is that his sin, okay, he's not looking at other people's sin, this is very important. It's his sin, his own sin, that was killing him on the inside, that was affecting him physically. It was making him literally sick because of unconfessed sin. But when he confessed, he says, when he confessed, Remember 1 John 1 verse 9? By the way, I think it would do us all uh, uh, amazing if we memorized 1 John 1 verse 9. Maybe you memorized it already when you were a kid. I know when I was young, it, 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 uh, this verse often came up. 1 John 1 verse 9, which says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful verse. What a beautiful promise. There's two key words there, though. 1 John 1 verse 9. One is if, if we confess, and two is all, 
all unrighteousness. Do you believe that God can forgive all sins? Do you believe this, that text, verse John 1, verse 9? Oh, but Glenn, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand the skeletons in my closet. You don't know what I've done. Yes, yes, and you don't know what I've done. And thank God that I don't need to know, and you don't need to know mine. Thank God that the only one that needs to know is God. And, and, and when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So brothers and sisters, I don't need to know, only God needs to know. So confess it, give Him, confess it with all your heart, come to the cross, and leave those things there and know that you are forgiven. Psalms 32, we get this truth, we get this idea that in order to receive joy, you must experience forgiveness. Let me say that again. In order to receive joy, in order to have true joy, you must experience forgiveness. You must experience the forgiveness from God, which leads you to forgive others. Joy and forgiveness, they go hand in hand, according to Psalms 32. You know, recently I heard a story on Christian radio. Recently, as in this week, I heard this story and I thought, man, I, 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 gotta, I gotta repeat that story. Apparently, it's a very popular story. It's a story uh, of, a, of a father and a son in Spain. Beautiful story. I don't know how true this is or not, but I'd like to think this is true. And the story is that uh, the son and the father became estranged. They stopped talking to each other. And so the son basically ran away. He didn't want anything to do with his father. And so he, he ran away. He put himself in a place that, that he didn't have to see his father, didn't have to hear from his father. And so the story says that the father started going after his son, started searching for his son. And months after months of trying to find him, trying to locate him, trying to talk to him, he still couldn't find him. And so in, the la in a last desperate effort to find his son, the father put an ad in a Madrid newspaper, and the ad read this, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. At noon that Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. Church family, in order to receive joy, you must experience forgiveness. It's true in the Bible. Luke 15, uh, uh, Jesus makes a huge promise. Luke chapter 15, verse 7. You might have heard this before. It says, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Did you guys hear that? Luke chapter 15. You, you, you guys need to look that up. There is joy in heaven when one sinner repents and comes home. There is joy in heaven heaven. Now, did Jesus get this idea out of a vacuum? Did Jesus kind of just make this idea up? No. I propose to you, as I've, as I've said the last two weeks, that Jesus knew these psalms. He sang these psalms. This, this was Jesus' hymn book. And, and, and these psalms uh, were used by him. to. He cried out to God using these psalms. And, and even his theology was formed because of these songs. So church family, joy and forgiveness, they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You need joy. If you want joy, you have to experience forgiveness. There's a challenge for you today and for me today in a time of crisis. Let's choose to forgive. Let's choose to forgive. Consider that bitterness and resentment and hate are from the enemy and they are hurting you physically not just spiritually. And if you want to receive joy, you must forgive. Not to be the judge, but sometimes I wonder, why aren't our churches experiencing more joy? Perhaps, perhaps, it's because there is still bitterness, there's still resentment, there's still hatred in our hearts. In fact, if you look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, you'll see forgiveness is not an option, Colossians 3, 13. Forgiveness is not an option for the Christian. If you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, that means that you've been forgiven by God 
and it means that you must forgive others. It says it twice in Colossians 3, 13. Forgive one another. Forgive one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Brothers and sisters, please hear the word of the Lord today. If you are a Christian, that means that you have been forgiven, and it means that you must forgive. Now watch this. We're about to turn the corner. Because I believe for most of you who are watching me today, for most of you, none of this, none of what I said is new to you. Perhaps this is just a reminder of something that's very important, but probably none of what I've said from the beginning to now is new to you. But we're going to turn the corner. The next two verses in Psalms 32, you may not know. Psalms 32, we're going to read verse 6 and 7. Please, I hope you're still with me. Psalms 32, verse 6 and 7. And if you're and I've lost you along the way, come back. Psalms 32, verse 6 and 7. I want you to see this. This is very important. It says this, For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. That song that Nela and Julieta just sang. That's from Psalms 32, verse 7. Now I want you to see this with me now. There is a blessing. There is joy in forgiveness, right? We just covered that. Amen. We, we can agree with that. There is freedom when you've been forgiven. Yes, amen. We, we can agree with that. But verse 6 and 7 says, There is also a blessing of protection from those who have been forgiven. What? what? How does that make sense? Look at verse 6 and 7. That's what it says. That the blessing of not just, not just the guilt being gone, uh, not just the weight being gone, but the blessing of protection comes to those who have been forgiven as well. And if you question that, I, I want to remind you of a story in Exodus. The story of the children of Israel who painted blood on their doorposts. It doesn't make any sense, right? But what, what protected them from that plague was the blood. Was the blood pointing to the Lamb and His forgiveness. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7 with me. It says, Songs of Deliverance. You know, I had to look that up. Songs of Deliverance. I looked up that that uh, that term songs of deliverance and in hebrew it's a special word it's actually a military term and the hebrew word for songs there is ron and ron are basically songs of deliverance it also means shouts of victory when mili when the military came back the military and the people that they were coming back to, they would be a roan. They would be a shout of victory. It would be songs of deliverance. And that's what God surrounds us with, these songs of deliverance. So I want you to see this. When you've been delivered, when you've been forgiven, when you've been protected, you can't just sing. <laughs> you got to really sing. You got to even shout, the Bible says. Do you guys understand? <laughs> And that's why, church, and let me say this with all the, the love in my heart and, and with as much humbleness as I can, okay? Um, I want to just say this. It really bothers me when people, including church leaders, uh, cast judgment on those who love to express themselves in worship. It really, really bothers me when that happens. You know, you can't judge people. You can't judge people when they express themselves in worship. Say they, they want to lift up their hands, they want to raise up their hands in, in worship. You can't judge that when they choose to really sing or even clap or even shout. You can't judge that. Why? Because you don't know where they've been. You don't know what kind of struggle they've been through. You may never have experienced their victory. So let them sing. Let them clap. Let them shout even. Let them throw up their hands in praise, in worship. Amen? <laughs> maybe, just maybe, they've experienced what, God, what, what David is describing here in Psalms 32. They've experienced deliverance. <laughs> you know, our baby, our little Jan, man, I'm telling you, God has taught us so much through her and her life. Uh, she's been through so much in her two and a half years of existence. And I can't believe it's been that long already. She's come through so much. 
Now, some of you may know what I'm talking about when I'm telling you this, that there were days, man, I remember my wife just holding our little Yana when she was little, just holding her, like, lifeless body. Like, she wouldn't move for hours, for hours. She wouldn't move, she wouldn't eat, she was not doing well. She was so sick and we couldn't even figure out why. I remember days that we, we couldn't even put the feeding tube in. We had to have Lisa come over and put that feeding tube in her nose and through her nose just so that she could have uh, 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 n nourishment. And uh, I just remember, man, those were horrible days. Those were, those were horrible nights. And I, I, I thank God for such a strong, strong mom. And I thank God for all the people, including many of you, who prayed for our little Yana. You know, those days when she was losing her hair and, uh, and she was just getting so sick and we didn't take her to the hospital, man. And, and uh, just all that she's been through. Now, with that said, I... I uh, <laughs> I know this probably doesn't surprise you when I tell you tell you this, um, that she's our little worshiper, man. <laughs> you know, if, a long time ago, she she we would listen to this song called "He Is Worthy" by Chris Tomlin, and even a long time ago, even when she was even littler than she, littler than she is now, she would listen to that song. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? And she would just lift up her hand. Like we wouldn't tell her to do that. She would just lift up her head and she would just sing and just just praise God. Uh, even this little baby, she taught us, man, she's taught us so much. You know, right now she's been listening to the song, The Blessing. And uh, she'll get up with her, her little karaoke mic, you know, and she'll get up and she'll start singing. Uh, he is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Oh, we love it. We just laugh and, and our hearts are so happy as we see this little two-year-old praising God with all of her heart and all of her soul. Man, Psalms 32 verse 6 and 7 is a roan. It's a song of victory. And it says, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Church family, Psalms 32 is teaching us some very important truths for our time. Whenever you are afraid, <laughs> whenever you are afraid, and you're about to face your day, you're about to face coronavirus, know that God surrounds you with songs of deliverance so that whenever you are afraid, sing along with Him. Sing praises to Him. Shout them if you have to. You know, let me tell you why we sing. We sing sometimes because we believe it, but sometimes we sing so that we can believe it. And, we, and we're studying the book of Psalms during this coronavirus because I want you to know and I want you to remember that your weapon is a melody. There's something powerful about praising God through the storm and through the struggles. That's why we're doing the book of songs and we're crying out to God during this time. Psalms 32 teaches us some very important truths. There's a connection between joy and forgiveness and there's a connection between forgiveness and protection. I hope you saw that here today. Those are not just my ideas. How many of you need protection from that virus? How many of you need to know that you are physically safe? Brothers and sisters, now is the time. We've been given the chance to confess our sins, to make things right with God, and to make things right with others. You know, a few years ago, man, I, I gotta say, uh, uh, this was a few years, this was actually like the, one of the big, the, the first biggest events that we had when, I, when, I, when we came here to, uh, to Illinois. And, uh, the, and that was the, the, young, the young adults had a fall week of prayer. If you guys remember that, I remember that well. You know, it's amazing your first impressions of a, of a church when you first go. I remember each night, I remember every presenter, I remember what they said. In the middle of the week, uh, Michael, our own uh, Aussie, Michael uh, uh, Schofield, spoke about this very subject. He spoke about forgiveness. And it, w it was amazing. He actually gave this, this uh, illustration about the the uh, the Alaskan Eskimos, and the Eskimos have a term, and I know I'm going to butcher it, but I wrote it down. Isu magjuju nainermik. Isu magjuju nainermik. <laughs> what a word. Isu magjuju nainermik, and it literally means not able to think about it anymore. And what that what that means is in our in our terms it means I forgive you. It's done. I forgive you. I'm over it. 
I forgive you, it's in the past, it's out of my mind. Isu mag juju niner mik. He went on to give the benefits of forgiveness. <laughs> Listen to this. When you forgive, you have healthier relationships. You have greater spiritual and psychological well-being. We just saw that in Psalm 32, right? You have less anxiety, less stress, less hostility, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, stronger immune system. What a message for our time. Improved heart health and higher self-esteem. All of these are benefits of forgiveness. No wonder the Bible commands us, not suggests, not suggests it, but it commands it to be joyful, to forgive and to have joy. It commands us to have joy, Psalms 32. You remember Philippians 4? It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. James chapter 1 says, count it all joy. Commands us, the Bible commands us to have joy. Then why are so many believers, Glenn, why are so many believers sad? Why do so many believers come to church with a scowl look on their face and they can't smile and they can't encourage those that they come to church with? Why is that that they look like them baptized in vinegar? Why is that? Church, the Bible commands us to be joyful. It commands us. And I thank God that Psalm 32 doesn't just command us to have joy, it actually shows us how. It's when we forgive. It's when we experience forgiveness, experience from God, experience forgiveness from God, and then we experience forgiveness and give it to others. We receive it and then we give it. We receive forgiveness and then we're able to give forgiveness. By the way, that's the gospel. And maybe that's why sometimes it, even at church, we don't see people who experience joy or who have joy. It's because the gospel is lacking from their life. I want to end with a true story. Actually, it's a true illustration. I told you a few times that I've been reading some books about Chicago and, uh, and it's just really interesting and I'll, I'll let my kids, before coronavirus, I'll let my kids just play at Barnes and Nobles and just explore and I love just picking up books about Chicago and uh, even in the time I have, I'm able to, 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 to read a whole, whole books about Chicago and, and I love it. I've even told people that grew up in Chicago about a lot about their city and uh, it's just amazing. One thing that I will never forget, one really cool thing about Chicago is a place on the south side of Chicago, and it's the it's a historical place called Oak Woods Cemetery. Ever been there? Hopefully not. Um, but get this: they're in Oak Woods Cemetery, and I'd love to maybe pass by there someday. Um, but they're in Oak Woods Cemetery on the south side. Is a Civil War burial ground where over four thousand Confederate soldiers are buried. So think about this. On the south side of Chicago, you have a cemetery, a Civil War burial ground, 4,000 Confederate soldiers, not Union soldiers, Confederate soldiers that are buried there. And also are buried in that same cemetery is Chicago's first African-American mayor, Mr. Harold, Harold Washington, and many prominent African-American civil rights movement leaders. Think about what I just read you there. Both groups, Confederate soldiers and civil rights leaders, both groups buried together. That means that both groups, when Jesus returns, will rise from their graves together. And if they've received forgiveness of their sins by the blood of Jesus Christ, they will ascend together in the clouds. No time for hatred, no time to think black or white, no time to think who was right or who was wrong. There will be no two sides, only one. Those who have been forgiven. Brothers and sisters, you want to experience the joy of heaven? Me too. Then we must experience forgiveness from God, and forgiveness towards others. This is my prayer. And may God add his blessing to his word today. Amen.
for this next song. Um, as Pastor Glenn just talked about forgiveness and the joy it brings. Um, I know this next song is going to bring back a lot of memories just because of uh, uh, how familiar the chorus is. It's a new song, but then again, it's not a new song. You'll see what I mean. But it's a song about joy when we leave the past behind because of what Jesus has done, because of what God has done, because of his forgiveness, his grace, which he gives so freely to us, that we could say uh, goodbye to the old and look forward to the new in Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's all sing. No height or death. No height or death can separate.
How to utilize the Adventist Giving website. In this tutorial, we'll cover making donations through the Adventist Giving website, reviewing your donation history, and finally, setting up and reviewing recurring payments. A quick disclaimer. In this tutorial, we'll be using the word donation loosely to include the returning of your tithe as well as other types of donations. Let's begin. So to access the Adventist Giving website, you're going to need to enter the URL adventistgiving.org. The first thing that you should see is a welcome page which will prompt you to choose the church that you would like to donate to. Once you begin typing the name of the church, a drop-down menu will immediately appear with a short list of churches that best match your entry. You will want to pay special attention to the street addresses of each listing as some churches may have a common name that is used across the United States. Identifying the church you are looking for by the correct street address will prevent you from making a donation or returning your tithe through the wrong church. Select the church that you'd like to donate to by clicking on it. Once you have chosen your church, you will then be taken to the Donate tab. The first screen shown will be step one of the donate process, where you will see a virtual replica of a tithe envelope. Here you have many of the same entry fields as you would on a physical tithe envelope, including tithe and church budget. These fields are also sectioned similar to how most physical tithe envelopes would be, distinguishing the local church, the conference slash union, and world budgets. Also note that at the bottom of each section, you can find more offering categories like women's ministries or adventurers that are not initially listed on this page. Once you have entered all dollar amounts into their respective fields, you will see a total at the bottom. If all looks good, click continue. On the next page, you will be given the option to make your donation as a guest or to log in or register. Registering to the website will allow you to save your profile information and payment method so you don't have to do it every time you come on the website. It also allows you to set up and review recurring donations, but more on that later. For the purpose of this tutorial, we will go through the steps for registering a new account. To do this, click the registration button. A pop-up screen will appear with fields to enter your personal info, your mailing address, and the creation of a password. Your mailing address is used to send you any text documents. Once completed, click register. After you have created your account and logged in, the next page is where you would add or select your payment methods. There are options for adding a debit card, a credit card, an electronic check, or checking account. Once you have added the necessary payment method or methods, select the one you would like to use for this donation and click continue. On the next screen, you will verify that all the information is correct and choose whether or not you would like to receive a confirmation email. After all is verified, click confirm donation. And just like that, you have successfully made a donation using the Adventist Giving website. So to see your donation history, once you're already logged in, go to the top right corner of the screen. You'll see your name. Click on that. In the drop down menu, you'll see account history and profile. Click that. And the first thing that's going to pop up is your donation history right there, front and center. You can scroll through and see all the different um, payments or donations that you've made. And it'll give you details. If you click on one, you can download, print those details. You can also request a refund if that's ever necessary. If you go over to the recurring tab, then this will give you a history or show you basically whatever recurring payments you have set up will be seen here. Setting up a recurring donation on the website is as straightforward as making a one-time donation. In fact, if you go back to the donate tab, we have our virtual envelope and at the top right corner of that envelope, you will see one-time donation and recurring donation. What we have already covered is how to complete a one-time donation. The steps are the same for a recurring donation with a few added features at the beginning. If you click on recurring donation, you will see some additional entry fields appear. Here you can choose how frequently you want your donations to occur, the start date of your recurring donations, and your income, but your income is optional. Other than those few additions, the steps are pretty much the same. Adventist Giving makes online giving a simple and easy way to return your tithes and offerings, paving the way for the future of God's work in the Seventh-day Adventist Church.